Welcome to the next installment of the Many Minds podcast, where we encourage collaborative community healthcare using Many Minds for better outcomes. I am Alex Davis, physician assistant, along with Tyler Murray, nurse practitioner. And the two of us work together at Summit Brain, Spine, and Orthopedics in Lehigh, Utah. The purpose of the podcast is to promote interaction between specialties. Dig into what makes your specialty special. I want to talk about the stuff we don't usually get to talk about as other healthcare providers. What's life like in your shoes and what can we do to support what you're doing to provide better care for your patients? A uh, general disclaimer, the podcast represents the opinions of myself, Alex, and our guest on the show. The content from this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We're just here to learn and have a good time together. And with that, we're going to jump into this week's uh, podcast. So we're joined by Viet Le, um, and you're uh, kind of a holder of many hats, if you will. <laughs> Cardiology being maybe the specialty that, um, as far as medically speaking, but you're yeah. involved in research, yep. you're also teaching. Um, why don't you go ahead and just dive into a little bit of your background and kind of currently what you're, what you're doing? Sure, sure. I, I often tell people that I am uh, the Forrest Gump of PAs. <laughs> if you can uh, remember the Forrest Gump movie, uh, kind of finds uh, himself in all sorts of amazing places and may not be the right person to be there, but here I am, right? So uh, through through my career, I, I started out as an athletic trainer, actually. So my undergraduate is exercise science with athletic training emphasis. And uh, that was way back in 2000. And I was a head athletic trainer uh, for a year at a high school. And, and I just, you know, after a year of working at a PT clinic, then teaching in the afternoons and covering all games for all teams. And a bumps and bruises clinic. Uh, I found that 80 hours a week was just a little too much um, in that space. And but I loved it. I loved being on the sideline. So I, I actually reached out to our former head athletic trainer at the University of Utah, um, Gerald Fisher, and he was head athletic trainer of the basketball team. So the Rick Majerus era. And uh, he he said, well, "Man, that's a lot of hours." But I get you, man, because he was an uh, athletic trainer as well. Mm -hmm. Said, so "Why don't why don't you do what I just did?" And I said, "What is that?" Well, I became a PA. I said, "I, I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what a PA was." Yeah. And I uh, so he he explained, and I applied up the University of Utah into their program. And and you know, this is the thing, you just. You put your application in, they tell you, oh, it'll be like three or four years. You know, you have to apply several times. And then if you get an interview, it's two or three more times. I got in an interview um, that year and I thought, well, that's crazy. That never happens. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I went, I just went and had fun. And it turns out if you just have fun in your interview, it's a good thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So they were like, yeah, okay, this guy plays well in the sandbox it's <laughs> good we'll have them yeah. and uh so I, I they said hey why don't you join our class <sighs> finances were not set we were newly married and uh so you know you have a mortgage and suddenly you're off at school again um during that time i went and worked at lds hospital as a cardiac therapist so i leveraged my exercise oh, sure, physiology yeah. degree yeah and turns out that was the right thing to do. I did that on the weekends um, while I was at PA school and all of the cardiac team got to know me. And then um, they said, hey, why don't, why don't you join our cardiology group um, as you graduate? And that's what I did. I did that for about two years. Um, not, it was amicable. Um, but I, I left for occupational medicine um, and did that for about seven years at the VA, Salt Lake, uh, the George Wallen. And uh, about 2012, I decided to come back to um, cardiology, but yeah. they only had a research position. <laughs> I'm like, research? I didn't do any research. I have no idea what this is. Yeah. And they said, well, that's good because we don't know either. We don't, we're not quite sure what uh, you'll do, but we need a PA, we think. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. I said, there okay, yeah, so I, I, in 2012, I became a cardiovascular researcher. Um, and the last decade, uh, 12 years, really has been amazing. It's been amazing. But during that time, I uh, did some things for Intermountain, including teaching um, high school students about 
health professions. And that's when John Barrett's mom discovered me oh, as yeah. I was teaching, um, you know, on health professions. She calls John and says, you need this PA. He needs to teach at Rocky Mountain University. <laughs> <laughs> and it hadn't even started yet. We hadn't even gotten our first group. We're, weren't even teaching yeah. a cohort yet. No, yeah. they, were, you know, yeah. they were still putting it together. And so I, um, he reached out and said, yeah, come on, come on out. And, and so that kind of was my, my first uh, teaching gig. I, I had some ties with the University of Utah and did some of their interviewing for yeah. student cohorts, but but I had never really taught a course at the PA program until Rocky Mountain University. Um, and so that was the teaching portion. And uh, a few years later in 2017, I became part-time, was adjunct initially. But through all of this, um, I, I went you know, so this is the lesson. You just go full feet, you know, both feet in. Just jump. Jump into it. Yeah. And uh, if, if you're hesitant, it's full send. You just have yeah. to full send. Otherwise, you're going to, yeah. yeah, you know, fail fast, fail quickly, fall forward. And <laughs> That's awesome. I, I love that. That's the so, best advice. You yeah. know, I mean, what can happen? You fail. And then yeah. you just get up and do something else, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, at the American College of Cardiology, I started just getting involved in stuff. Yeah. And next thing I know, they're like, hey, will you co-chair this, uh, you know, PA work group? Um, it, there's a thousand PAs in, in the American College of Cardiology. We just need a, a chair. And I said, I don't want to be chair. I can be co-chair. And they go, yeah. oh, okay. So okay, they yeah. put two of us together. One year position that extended eight years later. I was still wow. in the position. Wow. Um, but during that time, then um, I met all the people that led me to the Academy of PAs in Cardiology, yeah. ended up on their executive board, and then spent, uh, not spent, but I was honored to uh, be a, the president for two years. And I'm actually serving my last year as the immediate past president. Um, so I'm in my second year of that. Uh, while I'm Utah Academy now, yeah. president. <laughs> yeah, president of the local Utah Academy yeah, of PAs. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's kind of like the, the uh, you know, the journey through everything. Um, there's much more detail in all For of that. For sure. But, but, you know, hopefully you've caught up to I the love craziness it. that's me. Yeah, so you're saying that if I'm not familiar or comfortable with research, I can still get involved and do it. A absolutely, absolutely. No, you know, the, the one thing about um, PAs and nurse practitioners is and nurse practitioners probably more so than PAs. Um, we're just not taught to do research. It's not part of like the intention of your career path. Right. It, yeah. it just, you know, we're kind of taught to uh, clinical and to, to go out and, and uh, be with patients. Um, but our physician colleagues, that's kind of, they're in med school. They're like, oh, okay, you, you know, this uh, attending grabs you and says, you're going to do like chart review and, you know, do some retrospective analysis. And they're like, I didn't know, too bad, you're doing it anyways. And yeah. so then, you know, yeah, then yeah. they're doing clinical trials. And it just is baked into their yeah, pathway. Fosters that environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they think about it a lot, um, even if accidentally. Yeah. We just don't get a lot of those opportunities because it's not intentional. Um, but boy, there's a huge need. There is a huge need. It's, it's very similar. The analogy is how we interact in the medical space in healthcare. We can team up on the research side as well. I mean, I'm a sub investigator. I'm a principal investigator in certain trials, but I'm a sub investigator, which means I really run that role similar to as I would as a PA in medicine. I'm a sub investigator in a research trial. And yeah. so it, it's very similar in terms of how you think and how you help a, a clinical trial roll outwards. That's awesome, that's amazing, yeah. And I, I agree, there's a huge need for it. Yeah. I think there's just the hesitancy from people of I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do, how do I, yeah. how would I even go about doing this to yeah. get involved in that kind of thing? And I think similarly for the organizations, and you're heavily involved, we just talked about that, a lot of the organizations. <laughs> But yeah. again, there's a need for it. And I think there's an avenue. Yeah. And how, how would you suggest, what would you say to people in their field, whether it be yeah. physician assistant or nurse practitioner getting involved in their local organizations? Well, so this is, you know, this is the important part. I, I think what you said is how do you get involved in your local organization? Um, as part of uh, this, my tenure, um, I have brought forward a new position in the U Utah Academy, which is industry relations chair. And so Sam Shawan is is up at uh, oh, Sam. I hopefully didn't butcher your last <laughs> name, but he's up at the University of Utah, PA in in Hemonk, and was just interested. Like, hey, I want to do something in the industry space, and um, 
So I've been feeding him my contacts for the medical science liaisons, otherwise known as MSLs. And this is the, the scientific medical side of any pharmaceutical industry. They come and they, they can teach you about the science, they can teach you about the disease state, what you know, the molecules are, et cetera. The, the ones that we generally are like, oh, hey, you know, I don't have time to talk to you, is the marketing side. And it's unfortunate because they bring a lot of great information. Mm -hmm. And um, we can sometimes shut them out um, out of ignorance out of ignorance they really have information but you you do have to you know figure out right. that, that relationship yeah. but um i would say now the utah academy we're making it intentional uh we want industry relations between our organization and industry but it's a way to pull our pa members and nurse practitioners can be part of uapa um to to be involved in that um to that end is there financial perks to being part of these organizations what what are the types of advantages for someone to think about joining uh, organizations as such. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are tangible and some of them are a little bit intangible, probably a lot more intangible than tangible in, in the sense of like uh, return on investment. You know, I, I'm a member, so I get all these things. Yeah, sure. you know, you get access to CME, you get access to um, well, a network and, and, you know, emailing other members if you're trying to find someone. Um, and then perhaps a way to um, access, it, you know, what legislation's going on, okay? On the intangible side is if you get involved in an organization, we, you know, I've grown up, I no longer call it a resume, but we do call them resumes. <laughs> it's a yeah. curriculum vitae. Yeah. It's your yeah, yeah, life's yeah. work, yeah. right? It's what you, it's a body of your, your life. Um, and um, this is what sets you apart, is if you're involved in organizations, that's part of ranking in academics mm -hmm. is they like what are you doing with your community well i've just been working at this clinic and i just see patients okay but what what more what have you done like what are you doing with your community good perspective. and so yeah joining an organization allows you to and and actually perspective is the right word it broadens your perspective then you're not in an echo chamber of a clinic with just the clinicians you work with you've broadened that you have conversations on a wider basis you go oh you guys do that we we should do that. Um, and why don't you use that therapy? Oh, okay. So it, it broadens things because we, we work in echo chambers. We really do. Mm -hmm. um, yep. it's, it's a really neat thing to then, uh, I call it brackish water, right? Is, is to kind of touch up against some salty individuals other places <laughs> when you're like fresh water, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and it really, really opens your mind to like, oh, okay, yeah. practice is different in, in different areas. Yeah, even within your own specialty, yeah. I feel like just interacting with other providers doing your same specialty, I think you can broaden your perspective and see what other people are doing in your own absolutely. space. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's yeah. things that, that are done you know, in, in, in your specialty by other people in different places, and you're like, wow, why, why do you do that? Yeah. And you know, it, can be, it can be region specific, it can be insurance uh, specific, but they may have some data yeah. that you're not aware of. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So for our listeners, let's, let's tap into um, a week in the life of Viet. I want you just to kind of tell me what a Monday through Friday looks like for you at Current with all your different hats. Yeah, and yeah. how are you balancing that? Because you've got family at home as well. <laughs> um, I, yes, and, and it's different at different points in your life. So, uh, you know, let me just start by saying currently, currently I'm midway through life. Um, you know, I have three uh, is, children. Is, is 29 midway through life? <laughs> ah, yeah. yes. Oh, I, I love you. I love you. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I have a 23-year-old. Oh, I, I have a 19-year-old yeah. yeah. and I have a 14-year-old. And so it's a little bit different uh, navigating their life yeah. now in terms of activities. Um, certainly you pull me back 10 years and you know, you're, you're attending cross country meets, you're going to swim meets. And, uh, I coached my youngest daughter, uh, in her soccer for a while and, and now she's doing competition. Um, but what does it look like in, in a week of Viet, uh, when I'm not traveling yeah. because boy, this has been a heavy travel year to conferences, etc. But from Monday to Friday, uh, typically what happens is the, probably the most solid parts of my week are clinic. Uh, you just can't change that much, right? It's not that flexible. Um, it is what it is. And so I have Monday afternoons and then Tuesday mornings. But and how many patients are you seeing? Yeah, no, great question. So, um, and, and let me be clear, I, I'm preventive cardiology, which is even a, a more of a subspecialty than just general cardiology. So I see a lot of uh, referrals um, 
from my cardiology colleagues, let yeah. alone primary care, etc. cetera. Um, so it's, it's not running and gunning. Um, we, we do tend to fill up with a lot of consults. So I'd see about seven to eight on my follow-up day, which is Monday uh, afternoons. And then on Tuesdays, we usually stack the deck with about 12 patients, but that's, I'm not seeing all those. We have three of us, uh, my partners, uh, PA Leslie Iverson, and then uh, Jeff Anderson, Dr. Anderson, um, and then myself. And then we, you know, we just whoever's up to bat is, is um, seeing that consult. Uh, so I see about three or four of the consults, but about eight follow-ups um, in my regular afternoon clinic. Um, that Monday morning, I, I'm a pre-charter. I like to pre-round uh, on my patients, but at the same time, it's flexible moments where often, because um, I'm involved in over 25 different studies. Mm. Um, enrolling trials right now, I have about five clinical trials that are enrolling that I'm involved with. Then I have a bunch of data studies, and then I have a bunch of clinical trials that are in follow-up phase. Oh, so wow. each of those have a principal investigator. And fortunately, I'm in a tier where there's, um, you know, my three physician partners are generally the PIs. And so we only have those three big meetings that have to be at, and then we combine all of their trials in those meetings. In any phase three, or actually any trial, you need to have study, regular study meetings. And because you have to, you know, how are we doing on the money? Uh, are we appropriately screening? Um, how are we doing in terms of, you know, wow. adverse events? And uh, are there any issues with uh, the community in terms of like, have you overstepped? And, yeah. you know, they don't want you in their office or anything like that. Um, so, but we kind of pile that in. And so like Kirk Knowlton, he'll have like five studies that we discuss in his meeting. Jeff will have, uh, you know, five to six studies in his. Brent will have. And then mine are even even though I'm a PI on a couple of studies, we just pack them into where I'm already a sub I we just sneak my yeah, studies yeah, in yeah. there. Efficient. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so anyways, coming back to that. So, so you kind of get an idea, like through my week, I have these major study meetings. And then if I have flexibility, if I'm not pre-charting, I'm usually seeing a patient for screening, doing the physical exam. Um, we have study coordinators that are, you know, bringing in the patient, doing the main screening, and then we as PIs typically come in and do the physical exam portion, or the clinicians, mm -hmm. and then if there are any therapies to apply, like injections, then we do those. Yeah. Um, but not every single study meeting with a, a patient or study enrollee needs a PI or sub-I there. Sure. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So, but, but then, yeah, yeah. So then going throughout the week, I, I have multiple meetings. Um, for the studies, yeah, and then my national duties um, because I ha I'm on committees for the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, American Society of Preventive Cardiology. Um, I'm with the National Lipid Association, UAPA. Have you calculated how many hours per week that you're spending um, in your profession? I worry about <laughs> doing that because I think it would scare me a little bit. Um, but a lot of it, fortunately, is um, show up and give perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so... Um, Do you feel overburdened, overwhelmed? Uh, no. No, because it's fun. That's great, yeah. Yeah. It, as long as you're having fun, yes. But if, you, if, you, if I came into every meeting like, oh, my gosh, let's just get through the agenda, yeah. then, then I'd be burnt out. And then it would be like, Viet, you you said yes to these things yeah. but i say yes to things because i already anticipate i'm gonna have fun and so i i go and have you fun enjoy it, yeah. yeah i'm sometimes really <laughs> irreverent during meetings and yeah. i'll say things and uh, yeah. um you're not too crass but enough that it gets people like you know yeah, you hear yeah. that and, right, right. and uh um so but, everybody needs one of those yeah you gotta I, keep the room light I, you have to you yeah. have to and, and you you have to have fun while you're doing the work of improving healthcare. yeah um I, I think if it's too serious, then, I mean, you know, that's why we talk about burnout all the time. Uh -huh. um, I, I think people uh, go through and, and they forget that care should be fun. And there are moments that certainly are tragic um, and, and are serious moments. But even in those moments, I, I have found time to joke with my patients. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they appreciate that because they keep coming back, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they keep right. coming back. That's right. But I think they, yeah. they recognize I'm real. Yeah. Um, I, I'm the same person no matter where you meet me. Yeah, Love that's that. awesome. I think that's great advice is really trying to connect that way and keep perspective for the patients. Yeah. It's, a lot of stuff is already hard enough for these people that 
have some serious struggles, which is why they're in yeah. front of you and I. Right. So we right. can give them some sound advice, keep it real, but also try not add to the burden. And and I think that's that that's really um, the the most important thing is if you can keep the patient as a human being, then uh-huh. uh, you, you'd say to yourself, um, would I want that overly serious interaction? And in some instances, yes. But in the, in general, I want that relationship to be um, much more than sterile mm-hmm. uh, with my own clinicians as a patient. And I think yeah. the secret there is breaking up the monotony. I think that, you know, we, for instance, have taken half days on Wednesdays where we can focus our attention in other spaces. Yeah. And that's provided almost a sense of making sure you don't reach that burnout phase because if you're just in the clinic seeing patients every single day and trying to be the uh, you know the firefighter putting out the fires yeah. every single day it does weigh on you so having this chance where you can break up the day and do some and put your hands in other spaces it gives you a better perspective yeah. <clears throat> but it also just allows you to take some time to decompress from some of the other things you have to do on a daily basis in the profession so i think that's an important thing that listeners should should definitely hear yeah. to um I like what you said, though, because it's not fully away from medicine because you're doing something fun in a different way with medicine. Yes. And, and yeah. I think that's what we need. Right. Yep. Is, is sure. It's one thing to like go off for the weekend to go hiking, but it's also be- I think it's better in your work day to find ways to reinvigorate and change how you interact with medicine. Love that. Love you know, it. you have to find a different way to make it fun, and it has to be medicine. It really does, because um, because it really makes it enjoyable for you. Yeah, yeah, something to look forward to. I love it. Um, how about in a little bit more specifically towards cardiology? Yeah, who who would be the right patients to send to you? Who is it that you interact with, and what 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 does your interaction with patients look like because you're yeah. a little bit unique you're specialized even within a specialty yeah 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 um and, and i i just you know want everyone to recognize that when you say cardiology we kind of have this sense of like this big block of of specialty uh yeah. and yet there's heart failure there's electrophysiology there's structural heart uh, you know ct surgery sometimes gets lumped in there but there's surgery and then you have vascular medicine um in my area, preventive cardiology, now we're starting to have cardiometabolic um, clinics. And so it's wider and broader than, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I usually point uh, my fellow advanced practice providers to the fact that our physician organizations have like seven or eight different national organizations that represent those subspecialties. Um, But here as APAC, you know, the Academy of PAs, we're like, try to put you all under the same umbrella yeah. intent. Yeah. Um, so who would I see? I still am a general cardiology PA at heart. Mm-hmm. I love to see the whole thing and the whole gamut. Yeah. Um, I still have patients that have heart failure that I manage. Um, I still have ischemic, uh, you know, patients, uh, just your your bread and butter uh, coronary artery disease. Um, I love to manage hypertension. I still love to manage, especially lipids, but that's yeah. kind of where my preventive cardiology chops yeah. are, you know, is all, in the lipid love, space. We all love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you love it. Yeah. I'm so glad you love it. <laughs> Who doesn't like an LVL? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, if you if you have a general cardiology patient that you're like, uh, should I call cardiology or not? Yeah, go ahead. You know, send them to me. I and and I will help make sure that they get to the right specialty as well. Um, yeah. Because I, you know, I work very closely with my subspecialty partners. Um, yeah. I send patients off to get ablation or to get pacemakers, but. I keep them and manage those patients afterwards. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, we team up with uh, another uh, set of PA colleagues who will come in and do device interrogations. And, and I used to do that, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of fun to be able to manage those patients in, in my clinic. But um, by and large, I'm moving towards kind of a, a, a middle ground between cardiometabolic health and preventive cardiology because in the end, Almost all of those diseases, actually all of those diseases roll up to cardiology. Yeah. It, I mean, if you have now MASH and MASLD, they have cardiovascular disease before they end up with cirrhosis. Diabetes, they end up with, you know, coronary disease. Mm-hmm. Folks that have chronic kidney disease before they go to end stage renal and dialysis, often they have a cardiovascular event. So if you manage those things up front and you do it sooner upstream, 
then often you know that you can also stop their disease but uh, reduce their risk of having a cardiovascular event. So yep. those are the patients that I love to see. I, I've really gotten into the GLP-1s and, yeah. uh, of course, SGLT-2s. All of these, I, I tell my patients, I'm like, they're actually cardio kidney metabolic and they're side gig, you know, in this gig economy. They they do diabetes on the side. <laughs> that, that That's how they came out initially, but they're yeah. really cardiovascular kidney. Of course, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, of um, and they happen to do some diabetes work. That's awesome, that. and I feel like more probably almost more than any other specialty one topic i love to ask is what's trendy yeah and i feel like things change in your world all the time just this morning i saw a medscape article i was browsing through real quick talking about renal denervation for <laughs> hypertension yes <laughs> i was blown away at that yes. but you guys in your specialty are making advancements all over the place and and yeah. you're your recommendations seems like are evolving and always fine tuning constantly. But what would you say? What are the most trendy things right now in your yeah. world? Yeah, I mean, if we just start in my home base of preventive cardiology, um, probably the the most trendy thing is is recognizing LP little a. And if you ha you don't know what that is, it's lipoprotein A. It's a very similar molecule to LDL cholesterol. Very similar. Uh, it looks the same. Carries the same cholesterol esters. Both of them have a protein. <laughs> now it's going back to our lipid lectures. Yeah. Both of them have a protein called <laughs> I remember everything you taught me, yeah, by the way. Take me back, Professor. Take me back. Take me back. So, you know, cholesterol has to be bound by this apo, uh, this protein, apolipoprotein, and, and it's ApoB100. But LP little a is an additional tag underneath, and it makes this much more atherogenic than LDL cholesterol. So it's more likely to build plaque, but it's also thrombogenic. So it's more likely to cause clot. And, you know, the thing is, is only really one in five individuals have an elevated uh, LP little a. So um, when you, s I, you've heard me say this before. I hate it when people call LDL cholesterol bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. It just is a cholesterol. It, in higher amounts, it can cause atherogenesis. But LP little a, there's no good reason for it. It is a bad cholesterol. It, it just doesn't have a good function when yeah. LDL cholesterol already delivers correct cholesterol to our cells, etc. cetera. Um, it just happens to also cause atherosclerosis. But LP little a is a bad cholesterol. It, you know, so I would say that's trendy. We, um, we order more of those. I'm uh, a sub-investigator in two phase three trials looking at therapies wow. to reduce that. Yeah. Um, ordering ApoB, that's that protein. So instead of just trying to get an LDL cholesterol, when you get ApoB, you get all of them that eventually become LDL cholesterol. Hmm. So ApoB 100 is, is more prognostic. And um, if you treat it, lower it rather than just LDL cholesterol um, as a target, then what we see is even better risk reduction. Um, in, in the AFib space, atrial fibrillation, you know, the, what's trendy? Ablation as a first line. Hmm. Um, you, often what we, we, we said was you had to fail antiarrhythmics and then you mm -hmm. could go to ablation. But what we're finding is physiologically, you let that arrhythmia go a little too long and it just sets up. It sets up. So the people who are actually the best candidate are kind of your first time AFib that are having these paroxysmal events. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. it's not just one time because of a disease. Sure. Uh, like, you know, they, they had a fever or whatever and then yeah. had AFib. That's not who you ablate. It's the folks that then show that they're paroxysmal, they're occurring. And so in that first three to six months or a year, that's the person I would, I would refer uh, for early ablation. Um, then you're not messing with, you know, potentially lethal antiarrhythmics. You still need to prophylax people with, you know, for stroke. So anticoagulation yeah. is still important there. Um, you know, in the coronary space, we just, we don't electively stent everything and anything. It's no longer, you know, full metal jacket down. Um, you, get it, you get a stent. <laughs> yeah, you get a stent. You get a stent. You get a stent. You <laughs> bypass. Um, bypass. Yeah. <laughs> so, so really yeah. what, what it is here yeah. is, is this idea and recognition that stent doesn't cure the disease. Right, it will yeah. open up the area, yeah. focal, you know, disease area, yeah. but it doesn't actually reduce mortality. Hmm. What it does is treat, it's like a really invasive anti-anginal is mm -hmm. what it is, you know? So what we found is when in multiple trials now, when you match up against medical management, um, it's equal. You don't lose more lives. And by the way, this is like a positive stress test. And angiogram that shows pretty good stenosis but they're stable otherwise. They have chronic stable angina. 
you can let them be medically managed and feel wow. comfortable wow. about that. Huh. It's scary, but Different. at the same time, yeah. we've done the trials. Yeah. You know, so Very so cool. um, that's that space. And then, of course, awesome. Taver, Mitra Clip, you know, all these things. I, I will tell you, the, the funniest story was when I first came out into cardiology, me and Dr. Kevin Walsh, Kevin Walsh and I went to an American College of Cardiology conference, and we're watching, they're presenting this aortic valve replacement through trans catheter and it was in a pig and we we're both like what we'll never be able to see that in humans that was like 2005 guess what we do on a regular basis right Taver. Yeah, of course and it started out in the severe folks that couldn't tolerate surgery because they we'd kill them to now the you know moderate intermediate folks and now the question is is earlier better is earlier better wow. to replace these before you have physiologic structural changes yep. that's awesome yeah. i mean there's so many cool so things many. So i know many cool I, things. I figured you'd yeah. have a lot cardiology seems like that's how they are <laughs> there yeah. are a lot yeah. yeah it's so fun well i think we bought it probably better wrap it up here yeah. this has been a ton of fun <laughs> we could go all day but we better not hold everybody too much longer what do you think tyler what'd you learn today well yeah there's a lot to digest there i'll be honest with you <laughs> um I think the first thing, the first takeaway, I loved what you said, jumping in with both feet. I think anyone interested in medicine should jump in with both feet, yeah. test the waters. You'll find your space. You found your space. You're holding many different hats. I also like the idea of not being afraid to dabble in a couple of different things because I think it does help to prevent that burnout. Yeah. And uh, I love what you're doing with research because I think you're bringing to the forefront of medicine this idea of early intervention. What can we do to prevent? And that's something that we as westernized medicine needs further encouragement of is the yeah. preventative uh, factors of yeah. treatment. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Awesome to get to know you. Awesome to hear your story. And I appreciate you, you coming by today. Thank yes. How, how would people reach out to you? If somebody wanted to connect, maybe get to know you, ask some yeah. questions, how would they find you? Well, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Viet Heart PA. Um, that's the same handle for Twitter. You're welcome to find me on LinkedIn as well. I guess Facebook and uh, Instagram kind of fall together. Yeah. Um, I have dabbled into TikTok, but you won't <laughs> find a lot of videos there. Um, mainly it's just to kind of be in that space for my kids. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's so, awesome. But those are the main areas. That's awesome. Well, I encourage people to reach out. Viet is awesome. Uh, super helpful, great resource for anybody. As far as Summit goes, kind of similar outlets, Instagram, Summit Brain Spine and Orthopedics. Our YouTube channel is Summit Medical Institute. And my favorite, as always, is come see us in person every Tuesday morning, our interdisciplinary grounds case discussion at the Mountain Point Hospital in Lehigh, Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. Special shout out always to our production team. Can't see them, can't hear them, but those are the real heroes. Dallin and Amelia help us out a bunch, put this all together. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Okay, I love it. Leave a review for us. Let us know what you think, uh, what do you like to hear, what's working well. Who would you want to hear from? If you want to be a guest, shout out, reach out. We want to have you on the show. So we'd love to have you. They're not well, too mean. I yeah. uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Well, this has been another episode of the Many Minds Podcast, where we are encouraging collaborative community healthcare using many minds for better outcomes. I'm Alex Davis. I'm Tyler Murray. Thanks for listening with us. We'll see you, you next time. For this? Are you ready?